This morning, I have kind of a challenge in front of me for a couple of reasons. One is the, the subject, the missions, is a difficult one. It's kind of a challenging thing. We just sang a song, Take My Life and Let It Be. We talked about take my life, take my hands, take my feet, take my voice, take my silver and my gold, my moments, my will, my heart. Offering all those things to God. And that's pretty significant. What we just prayed encompasses virtually every area of our life. But there's something about the subject of God's mission in the world that adds another level of, of, of discomfort. Because suddenly now we're talking about something that could affect our geography. We're talking about something that affect, could affect our career. It's something that could affect the dynamics of how we're going to raise our family. It's something that could affect our plans for the future. And suddenly when you add missions into the equation, it's, it's almost like we want to add another verse. It would be, take my life and let it be, yes, let it be, Lord, let it be. <laughs> missions, just an uncomfortable subject sometimes because we have the sneaking suspicion that if we pay attention to God's plan for the world, it might make us uncomfortable. But there's another reason why this is challenging, and that's there's just so much to say, and there's so much that I would like to say. We could, we could look at statistics for unreached peoples in the world. We could look at unengaged and unreached peoples in the world. We could look at all the places that are still waiting for their very first Bible translation. We could talk about a world of immense need. There's so many things that we could look at in missions, and at some point, your attention span and... Uh, your desire to have some lunch and to get home, and mine too, are going to need to limit what we can talk about this morning. So for those two reasons, I know that, that this is a, a challenging kind of message, but I ask that you would join with me because I'm convinced that it's a challenge that's worthwhile. Why should a church be mission-minded? Well, Let's just go ahead and start out with probably the core, the most important thing, and that is that a church should be mission-minded because of God's glory. Simple, direct, straightforward, all-encompassing. It's almost as much to be expected in a sermon as Jesus is expected to be the answer in a question in a Sunday school class. It's going to come down to God's glory. And yet we know that that is true. In Psalm 29, verse 2, we are called to ascribe to God the glory due his name. And we actually can't do that because the glory that is due to God's name is immense beyond any words that we could ever begin to express. God is glorious, and he deserves his glory to be proclaimed everywhere. And that is really where, my, where missions begins. Look at the verse, the, or the passage that we looked at before we started out. Pastor Andrew read for us from Psalm 67. And I think this will help us make a couple of connections here. In, in Psalm 67, we end up seeing this, this remarkable, remarkable passage where it says, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O oh God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. You judge the peoples with equity, the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you. All the peoples praise you. Notice it started out us, us, us. And suddenly now we're looking at everyone, everywhere. And it comes home in verses 6 and 7 of Psalm 67. The earth is yielded its increase. God, back to us again. God, our God shall bless us. God shall bless us. And let all the ends of the earth fear him. 
We do want God's blessing on our lives. We don't want God to just let us be. We want his richest blessing, but his intention is that his rich blessing on us would be something that would have an impact on the ends of the earth. His desire is that as he blesses us, the whole world will come to know him. That's what he has in mind. Not simply, it's not just about me or my wife or my family or even our church. The things that God gives to us, the ways that God provides for us, are intended to impact people all the world over. And God, our glorious God, deserves for his glory to be proclaimed among all the nations. Why else should a church be missions-minded? Well, let's just go ahead and get the obvious ones out of the way, shall we? Not unimportant because they're obvious, but because of Jesus' example. Luke 19.10 says that the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And that's not something that just sort of pops up in the Gospel of Luke. That's something that we end up finding emerging from the pages of the Old Testament. God the Father talks about himself as a, as a shepherd who is seeking out his flock. And he's going to describe a flock that's lost and in need of, of someone to, to track them down and to find them and to give them care and to feed them. And Jesus is going to point to that and he's going to say, that is what I've come to do, to seek and to save the lost. But this is no casual seeking. This is no, I lost the dollar someplace and I'm going to see if I can find it. This is not... Where does the second sock of a pair always disappear to? And why is it that I have all these half pairs of socks? This is not at some point you give in to the mystery of life and you just know that there is some zone someplace that sock number two just likes to disappear every now and then and you just sort of give up on it and you stop thinking about it. This is a seeking and a saving that is all-encompassing and costly. We so well know the passage in Philippians chapter 2, don't we? where we are called to have the mind that was in Christ Jesus. In Philippians chapter two, Paul starts out, he says, have this mind that was in Christ Jesus, and he's gonna say that Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as something to be grasped, to be held on to. But he emptied himself, took the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You see that movement from, from not just sharing equality with God, glory of God in heaven, but taking the form of a servant in the likeness of men, humbling himself, being obedient to the point of death, what we end up seeing here is we see this crazy picture of downward mobility. We live in a society that is all about upward mobility. It's how much more can I learn, how much more can I earn, how many more promotions can I get, how much more famous can I get, how many hits can I get on my website, how many followers can I get, how much can I climb? And Jesus modeled instead of that a downward mobility that was a relentless, intentional pursuit of service. Not, not experiencing disgrace or embarrassment or failure just for its own sake, but because he saw a need, a need that was so radical that it included the death that all of humanity deserves for our sin. And he understood that the price that that would take in order to redeem us was going to be a price that was all-encompassing. And he was willing to humble himself. And in the process, we end up finding out in Philippians 2 that because he has so humbled himself, that God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We know that in God's kingdom those who exalt themselves are humbled and those who humble themselves are exalted. 
That's how the kingdom works. That's Jesus' example to us. This Jesus that we're meant to follow. There's a quote that many of you know by Jim Elliott, um, missionary and missionary martyr actually to, to Ecuador. He says, he's no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which, we, that which he cannot lose. He understood that everything that we have here eventually is destined to slip from our fingers. And he understood that if we're willing instead to give all that we have into, into the hands of God, to entrust ourselves fully to him, that in return, in return for giving up the things that we can't keep anyway, we have a heavenly reward that can never be taken away. No moth can destroy, no thief can break in and steal. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. We need our churches to be missions-minded because otherwise we don't understand as we need to the example of Christ. We also need our, missions, our churches to be missions-minded because Jesus has given us a very clear command. The third thing, third thing, because of Jesus' command. The Great Commission shows up all over the New Testament in different forms. There's a version of it in Matthew that we know really well. We've got it on your handout here. The, the go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And do notice, by the way, that one of the things that we're supposed to teach people to observe is to make disciples. So there's a never-ending cycle. The goal is that we're going to become disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And if we're not involved in this process of helping others to follow Jesus, then we're not following Jesus the way that we're supposed to. That's a part of the plan. Mark is going to talk about preaching the gospel to all creation. And Luke, we're going to see an idea of the gospel being spread out in Acts. It's going to be uh, a gospel preached to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the remote, remotest parts of the earth. And I confess that I cheated just a little with 1 Corinthians 9.16 because it's not so much an articulation of the Great Commission, although we can find a bunch of them in Paul, as it is a response. And we'll look at this again in a moment. But Paul's response as he looks at the Great Commission and he looks at God's call in his life, he says, woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. He sees that as just such a basic, such an essential element of his life that he realizes that a life that doesn't include that isn't a life lived out as God wants him to live it. The fingerprints of the Great Commission are all over the New Testament. And a church that's not missions-minded is missing a big piece of what it is that we exist to do. A fourth one. And this one's obvious, and we could actually spend pretty much the whole morning mustering data and arguments and statistics, and it actually would probably be lots of fun to do. But the fourth one is that we need to be missions-minded because of the world's need. Um, if you want to write out on the side, 1 John 5, 19, one of the things that the Apostle John, the Apostle of love, reminds us, he says, the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. That's just the reality. The default setting of human beings is that we are born slaves of sin, captives of the kingdom of darkness. Every human being is born in need of emancipation. The world has a need for this gospel message. In Romans chapter 10, Paul is going to talk about that, and he's going to say, because of that need, take a, look, take a look at our passage here. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Yeah, we know that. In fact, we know that no other name among, under heaven has been appointed among men by which we may be saved. That's it. The message of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, his finished work for us, that is the only escape from the bondage to sin and death into which we're all born. And so Paul says, how will, then they call, how will they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how will they believe in, whom, in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? There's just a simple, fundamental need for people to go and to speak the message to those that need to hear it. And Paul says, how are they to preach? 
unless they are sent. Dear ones, that's where we come in. Because we are going to send, and we're going to go, and we are the avenue through which this is to happen. But Paul says, not just if it doesn't happen, how horrible would it be? If messengers don't go, they can't hear. But look at the next part. As it's written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. The flip side is that there is something glorious and beautiful about proclaiming this message that's available in no one but our Jesus. Faith comes from hearing, hearing through the word of Christ. And an obvious reason why churches need to be missions-minded is the world's need for that message. Another quote that probably you've often heard, if God calls you to be a missionary, don't stoop to be a king. It's a high calling. Now, to be fair, I would add, if God calls you to be a plumber, don't stoop to be a king. If God calls you to be a teacher, don't stoop to be a king. Whatever it is that God's call on your life may be, whatever it is that he has designed you to do, the way that he means for you to transform the world, that is what we need to pursue. And whatever that might be, our answer to God needs to be yes. And anything but a wholehearted, absolutely, yes, Lord, whatever you ask, here am I, send me. Whether that means missions or whether that means something else, anything but a wholehearted yes is an inadequate answer to our glorious God. But one of the things that he just might call some of us or, as we'll talk about in a moment, some of our children or our grandchildren to do is to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And should he issue such a call, don't stoop to be a doctor or a lawyer or the president of the United States or anything else. On the other side of your sheet, and change gears just a little bit. Been looking at God and his glory, we've been looking at Jesus' example, we've been looking at Jesus' command, we've been looking at the needs of the world, but let's do go ahead and we're gonna shrink our circle just a little bit. Ironically, since our goal is to look a little broader, but in order to look a little broader, we need to look a little closer to home. Pastor Andrew and I kind of went back, back and forth here, just uh, tossing, back some, tossing back and forth some different ideas. Um, but I think that one of the things that we, we really need to acknowledge and understand is that one of the reasons that we need a church to be missions-minded is because of our own need. We need a church with a heart for the world. Got kind of a grocery list of some of the different ways that a missions-minded church can help us grow. And rather than having us go through the fill out, I just want to want to run through them. And then I want to look at a couple overarching things. And I need to tell you, this is a part of the message that I just kind of wrestled a little bit to wrangle it into shape and to see what's going on there and why is this. And I, I see these things and I know them to be true and I can, I can point to different verses, but are there common denominators? And I think there are. There are a couple. But first, let's just go down through the grocery list. A missions-minded church can help us grow stronger in our faith. You hear the stories of what God is doing through missionaries in all, ki other, all kinds of parts of the world. Doesn't it strengthen your faith? Doesn't it make you realize that God is mightier than we know, is mightier than we think of him? Doesn't it change something about the way that you trust him? A missions-minded church helps us to be bolder in our witness. Wait a second, if they can do that there in the face of that opposition, can't I speak Jesus' name here? A missions-minded church helps us to be more generous in our giving, to realize that I'm gonna end up giving to something that I'm not gonna see an immediate return. 
wait a second, I, I'm going to give to a to an offering for a missionary, and it's not going to affect the air conditioning that I have on Sunday morning, or the programs that my kids have, or the music that we sing, or anything else about what we're doing. I, I don't actually see any kind of immediate return for myself that I that I can detect whatsoever. Exactly. Having a missions-minded church helps us to be more generous in our giving where we begin to give open-handedly just for the joy of participating in what God is doing, not expecting anything in return. And if I may say so, having been in in a church leadership kind of position, having a missions-minded church is healthy for church leaders too when it comes down to finances and giving to realize that what we're calling our people to is a kind of generosity that goes beyond the local and touches on the global. Having a missions-minded church helps us to be more careful in our stewardship, and that's the flip side of giving because the more carefully we steward the finances God has given us, the more extra we have to get involved in the conspiracy of giving, to find a need and be able to give a little extra something to it. We find ourselves more careful. Being in a missions-minded church gets us more engaged in prayer. It gets us thinking about things that we never thought about. I'm guessing that for some of you, suddenly when you see headlines about East Asia, you notice them in ways that you didn't just a year or two ago. When you see that there are people that you know that have gone to a missions trip in a particular place, you've been, you've been interested in what they're doing and following what they're doing, suddenly that headline that you see becomes a prayer request. You become more attentive. You begin to, to think differently and you become more alert for the cause of prayer. Having a missions-minded church also engages us in community because we're, we're working together, we're doing something, we're accomplishing something, not simply gathering together, but we're a part of something bigger and there's something about that that is energizing, that's stimulating. And for those of you who have actually gone on short-term teams or served longer term, to be a part of something like that is a kind of community, and I think those that have been will attest to that, it is a kind of community, it is a kind of interaction, it is a kind of closeness and being involved in the cause of Christ around the world that you don't taste quite the same in other places. Having a missions-minded church also, I think, can help us to be more joyful just as we experience the blessing that comes of giving. It's really easy to say that it's more blessed to give than to receive. That's really easy to say. But as we begin to engage in that, as we begin to invest ourselves in what we have, we begin to discover that that's just not, that's, or it's not just a bunch of words, that that's actually true, that there's a blessing in it, there's a joy that comes in pouring yourself out for others. And a lot of these things happen because being part of a missions-minded church helps us to grow deeper in our understanding of the heart of God. Our God is a missionary God. Our God is a God who loves enough to sacrifice. Our God is a God whose heart beats for a lost world. Our God is a God who would send his son to seek and to save those who are lost. And you know very, very well that in order to truly love someone, you have to know them. The better you know somebody, the more intimately you can love them. If you have a complete stranger come up to you and tell you how much they love you and how much they appreciate you, you're like, but, but you don't really know me. You don't know the real me. We love God and we grow in our love for God as we come to know him better. And unless we have the world on our hearts, and a world, the world is a part of our understanding of who God is, unless we see his love for the world, we don't understand the God that we're trying to relate to. Being part of a missions-minded church helps us understand and love our God. This is the part that I was wrestling with a little bit. Um, back again to 1 Corinthians 9, 16, Paul saying, woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. Woe to me if I don't do this thing for which I was made. But I was wrestling with why missions and missions-mindedness does these things. And, and I thought there really, a lot of it boils down to perspective. 
Because when we look at the world through the lens of the Great Commission, when we look at the, the world through the lens of missions in general, we view God differently. And when we look at the world through that lens, we view the world itself differently. God doesn't rejoice in the death of the wicked, but that they would repent and live. How do I not begin to see the world in that way? And we also begin to have a different perspective on ourselves and our lives and of our purpose. We saw in, in the book of Titus that one of the things that God is doing, he's not saved us for good works, but he has raised us up to do good works. And a faith that saves is a faith that transforms and that has its outworking in the way that we live our lives. We know that to be true. We know from Galatians 5 and from John 15 that God has called us and Jesus has drawn us that we might bear fruit. Spiritual fruit in our character, but also fruit in terms of other people's lives who are changed and transformed. We know those things to be true. And being part of a missions-minded church reminds us that all of those things are a part of something even bigger. That both individually and together and in cooperation with all of God's people all throughout the world, that we are meant to be doing good works to be loving the world, those that are around us, to be bearing good fruit in a way that brings God glory. We need the perspective that a missions-minded church can bring. Today, we had a family dedication Today is Mother's Day. It's a time that we're looking at children and their present and their future. And I think that makes it all the more appropriate that we take some real time to look at this last one. We need a missions-minded church because of our children's needs. Our kids need a missions-minded church. As parents, I think, and I think that you'll agree, we all too easily settle for small ambitions for our kids. Oh, we have ambitions for our kids. We want great things for them. But in the final analysis, our ambitions tend to be too small. Just think of how often you have heard, I just want my children to be happy Life is not going to cooperate with that. Is it? Do we want our children to experience joy and satisfaction? Absolutely. Do we want our, do we want our children to go through life with nonstop grief? No, I don't think that's any parent's heart. But we know that it would not be good for them to be always happy. The person who is always happy is the person with zero compassion for the suffering of others. That's not okay. The person who's always happy is also lying because they're not really happy, however happy they might look. They're denying that they're angry. They're denying that they're sad. They're denying that they're hurting. And they are not fully experiencing the God of all comfort who is there to comfort them in their afflictions so that they can comfort others. God has not called us to the mission of keeping our children happy, which is a really good thing because we couldn't do it anyway. And the harder we try the less happier they are, the less happy they are. How about number two, I just want my children to be safe. There are no guarantees. There simply aren't. Let's look at it just on a more basic level. You ever notice when a little toddler falls down Fall down, boop, you know, land on that, that padded diaper and, you know, boop. And have you ever, you ever observed just a pause where down they fall and they kind of look around to see what's going on? And if they see that somebody's going, oh, poor baby, they burst into tears. <laughs> but if they see somebody go, oh, then they're smiling and they're happy. You ever notice that? 
I mean, it's amazing how, I mean, sometimes they fall down and it really hurts or it really startles them or it really scares them, but sometimes they fall down and they're just really kind of waiting and saying, how should I react to this event? And, and it, it's like they're, they're, they're sort of more acting and reacting to what's going on around them to the actual event itself. Remember, as, as parents, just having to, having to sort of tamp down that impulse to, to swoop in, to, to sweep in and to, to make everything okay. Um, if, if our kids aren't skinning their knee, they're not running fast enough. They're not trying hard enough. They're not stretching their limits. If our kids don't get some scratches and some bruises and some bumps, then they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing as children, stretching their abilities, stretching their capacities. Think of ourselves as adults. How often do we learn tremendous life lessons through our successes? And how often do we learn the tremendous life-changing lessons through the bumps and bruises and pains that are way bigger than that? We dare not make an idol of keeping our children safe. If we keep our children safe, we keep them children. And if we keep our children safe, we stunt their faith. Because they need to be stretching to a point that if God doesn't show up to rescue them, they are doomed. Because otherwise, they will not discover faith in our God. Or how about this one? I just want to watch my grandchildren grow up. Dear ones, may I ask, do we think that that's our right? Is it? Oh, it's natural. We want our kids close, so add to happy, safe, and close, right? But life may take them places that we never dreamed. And we see a whole lot of examples through Scripture where God will call children into purposes and causes that lead them far from the hearts of their moms and dads. Pastor Andrew and I were talking about the story of Hannah and, and the birth of little Samuel and how she gives Samuel to the service of the Lord, uh, a child that she longed for and waited for, but entrusted ultimately to God. Oh, our ambitions for our kids, they can be so small. I just want my kid to get a good education. I just want my child to be well-rounded. That's why they're in 14 summer leagues and playing through in three instruments and in six clubs and taking AP classes until they never sleep. I just want my children to get a good scholarship. Ooh. Is that really for them or is that for us? I want my children to have a fantastic career. Dear ones, do we have small ambitions for our kids? I, I worked for six years at a Bible college, and I worked in the admissions office, and so my job was to, to meet with parents and to meet with their kids and to talk about majors and what it was they were going to study and what they were going to do with their lives. And the school that I was working at was a school that was very much missions-minded, and so one of, the, one of the biggest majors, one of the biggest concentrations in the school was missions and intercultural studies, preparing people to be missionaries. And I... I noticed some odd parent patterns over the years, but one of the patterns that I noticed of people that were coming through my office is I noticed that I, would, that I encountered often a scenario where I would have a kid saying, I believe God is calling me to missions. I want to prepare for service on the mission field. And the parents would say, no, I think this is a phase you're going through. This is not realistic. I want you to study something else. Um, and I would discover tremendous resistance from parents to their kids thinking that God had a missionary call in their life. That pattern, all by itself, wouldn't be all that strange. Here's the thing that's strange. It was almost exclusively Christian parents who opposed their children's desire to go into missions. Non-Christian parents 
would look on and they would see that their kids have experienced some kind of radical transformation that they really don't quite get. They don't really understand this whole missions thing. They, they don't understand, but they see this commitment. They see this change that's happening in the lives of their kids. And I would see non-Christian parents after non-Christian parent being very, very supportive of their children going into missions. And Christian parent after Christian parent after Christian parent after Christian parent saying, I don't think that, that that's really something you should pursue. Dear ones, we need a missions-minded church to help us to have an ambition for our children that's a holy ambition that is worthy of the gospel because God wants more for our kids than we do. They were made to live boldly. They were made to live faithfully. They were made to live for his glory. And sometimes we need someone else to remind us of that and to give us a bigger vision than we might have for ourselves. Is it natural to want them happy? Yes. Is it natural to want them safe? Yes. Is it natural to want them near? Yes. But is that enough? And do we allow it to become an idol? Francis Xavier was a missionary to India and Japan and eastern Indonesia. And at one point he, he was writing a letter and he, he was from... Uh, he was from a part of France. He had been raised in a noble family. They had great expectations for him, and he left it all and headed off to be a missionary. And he wrote back, and, and he said, I, I would just wish that I could go back to Paris and talk to all the students in all the universities and tell the students to give up their small ambitions and come eastward to preach the gospel of Christ. Dear ones, our children need a missions-minded church so that they won't settle for small ambitions. Let me just take a little step off to the side for a moment and talk about church in general because we don't get the value of a missions-minded church unless we're plugged into it. And the next point is that our children need to be firmly plugged into their church family. Great to have a missions-minded church, Great to do all these things, great to have this emphasis, needful, important, vital, but unless our kids are firmly plugged in, they're not going to benefit from it fully. But they need to be plugged in because there are some things that our kids will not hear from us that they will hear from someone else. Parents, you know this to be true. And, if we're honest, all of us who are adults, weren't there things that we were willing to listen to from somebody else that we didn't want to hear from mom and dad? I said this, I think the last time I spoke, I used to drive, drive my parents a little nuts, and they were, they were tremendously gracious. My brother and I would come home from youth group and say, Jack and Kathy told us this about life. The couple that volunteered with the youth group, Jack and Kathy told us this. And my parents are just like, they had the wisdom not to say it, but they're thinking, we've been telling you that for years, and why is it suddenly it's a good idea when you hear it from them, and it's never been a good idea when you heard it from us, and they were wise enough just to bite their tongues and never say anything, but it's the truth. Our kids have things they won't hear from us, but they will hear from someone else. There are also some things that we cannot model and we cannot teach our kids, but somebody else can. None of us have all the spiritual gifts. Our kids need to benefit from the gifts of others. That's the whole point of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It's going to say that we can't say, well, just because I don't have this gift, I'm not important. But we also can't say that we don't have the need of a gift of anybody else. That the body of Christ has been composed of people with a variety of different gifts. And that we have need of all of those things. So our kids need to be exposed to gifts and, and to, to passions and to abilities that we don't have because we're not going to challenge them in those areas and we're not going to know how to equip them. Not only that, but um, I don't think I'm, I'm thinking I'm giving away any spoilers here to say that every one of us probably has character flaws. Parents, how often have we looked at that uncomfortable mirror called my kid and thought, why does he do that? Why does she do that? And then I go, I know why he does that. I know why she does that. That's me. 
our flaws show up in our kids, do you really want your children limited to your virtue, to your spiritual life? Do you really want them to stop growing where you've stopped growing, or do you want to see them be able to outgrow you and become something more than you have managed to be at this point? Do you want to be able to, to rejoice in them going on and achieving things that you never had? We need our kids plugged into church so that they will benefit from examples that we can't give. There are people that are going to exemplify things. They're going to have strengths that I don't have that my son cannot see in me because I don't have them. And there are areas where I have character flaws and difficulties and weaknesses. And he needs to see that it's possible to live another way. And that means he, that means he needs you. He needs to come here and he needs to see your lives. And he needs to see that you exemplify something that I don't. Our children need that. But that also means there are things that other people's kids needs, need to learn from us. There are two ways that we can end up with our kids not getting engaged in church, two typical ways. One is that we get them so busy, so involved in other things that it's like, well, I want, want my kid to do this and this and this and this, and they're going so many different directions that they never really engage in church. Another one is to make family, our family, my family, family time an idol in competition with the family of God. Our family time, together time, should actually be a part of our time with family of God. Are you demonstrating to your kids how your family is plugged into this family? They need to learn that. They need to see that. And we might think, well, I'm going to keep my kids from, from this difficulty or that difficulty. We're going to teach these things at home. We don't like the way that things are here. We've got a different set of values or a different set of standards. And we're going we're gonna to guard our family time. That's the most important thing. But I need to tell you, not only are you robbing from your children the opportunity to benefit from the lives of others, but you are also robbing from other people's kids the opportunity to see you. Because as much as your kids need to see somebody else's life, their kids need to see your life. There is somebody out there whose parents are weak where you're strong. And if your kids aren't engaged, then you're not engaged, which means you're also not contributing to this thing that we committed to do this morning. It's easy to do, isn't it? And I say you, and I really should be saying we at every step along the way. Finally, Plugging into church, needful because otherwise we don't benefit. But it's a missions-minded church family that's best equipped to accomplish a number of things. So back we are again to where we came from at the start. A missions-minded church family is going to be the best kind of church to give them a broader vision for the world. And our kids need that as much as we do. A missions-minded church family is going to be best equipped to help our kids to discover and develop their gifts and calling. Scripture is so very clear that he has given spiritual gifts so that we can serve the church, but he's given gifted people as well to raise up other people along the lines of their giftedness. Our kids need to see missionaries and hear story of missions and to realize that, that that's a life path that they can conceivably follow. They need, to, they need to be rubbing shoulders with people that are pursuing these different things in life so that they get a picture for that. And it may be that they're going to end up discovering their gifts and their calling as they hear somebody else describing how it is that they're serving God. They will also discover their gifts and calling, calling in the process of serving on short-term mission trips. There, is, there are two awesome things that can happen when you head off on a short-term mission trip. Actually, very, very typical. And they're both gloriously wonderful. One is, you might go on a short-term mission trip and realize that God is calling you to long-term missions. That's pretty cool. But there's another thing that might happen if you go on a short-term mission trip. You may realize that God is not calling you to long-term missions. And that is also glorious and cool. And it's glorious and cool because for a lot of us, that's an area of our life where we have never really even held it out to God and said, Lord, what would you have me do? And 
to actually taste and see and have experience and God's people confirm that maybe that's not the direction for you, that is freeing, that is glorious, that is wonderful, that's another kind of submission. If God is calling you to be a plumber, don't stoop to be a missionary. You with me? Now that sounds like heresy because sometimes we'll say, well, everybody's called to be a missionary. And in a sense, that's true, that we are all called to reach the people that are right around you. But we're talking about, if we're talking about missions in the sense of take up and head off and cross cultural lines and learn another language, not everybody has that call in their life. And one of the things that, that going and, and service opportunities can do is to clarify whether that's it or whether that's not it. And there's some people that are sitting right here in this room and you have got this little knot of guilt in your life because you realize that you've never even asked God if he might call you to that. And God's just waiting for you to say, Lord, do you want me to do this? And he's gonna say, nope, we're good, but you needed to ask me. We need to take this to him. And our kids need it taken to them, taken to God as well. They need to discover their gifts and calling and they're going to do it best in the context of a missions-minded church. But finally, there is this. A missions-minded church can help our kids develop holy ambition that is worthy of the gospel. The Apostle Paul uses the word ambition a few different times. Sometimes he'll talk about it as a negative thing, but sometimes he's going to talk about it as a positive thing. He's going to talk about having an ambition to live a quiet life and to work with our hands and to provide for those that are around us, and that's a, that's a fantastic ambition. He's also going to have to make it our ambition to be pleasing in the Lord in whatever it is that we do. That's a high ambition. And for himself, he's going to say, it's my ambition to preach the gospel where it's never been heard. That's a holy ambition. We need to have a holy ambition that is worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That our desire would be in whatever we do to glorify him. And a missions-minded church is one of the best places for our kids to weigh their ambitions and to present them to God and to develop an ambition that honors him. Fifteen years ago, we were at a family dedication in our home church in South Carolina. And one of the things that, that they asked as a part of the baby dedication, they asked the parents uh, a question that Francis Schaefer had used to present to Christian parents. This is a question that we were asked as we held our son in our arms. Have you covenanted with God, it's in the pull-out box there, have you covenanted with God to give back this child to him so that if he sees fit in his providence to call this child home to himself, you will not complain against him? Little did we know that we would have one that would fit that description. Or if the child grows to adulthood and is called to some form of special Christian service, you will not stand in his way but rather encourage him. I remember weighing that question in my mind and telling God, yes. My child is your child. And I will encourage him to follow you with a whole heart. Dear ones, that's who, we're we, that's who we are called to be and that's what we are called to do for each other to have a heart for the glory of God, a heart for his kingdom, and a passionate desire to see his name glorified in our everyday lives. And a heart to see his name glorified to the very ends of the earth. Here's a challenge. How big are our ambitions? How big are our ambitions for ourselves? How big are our ambitions for those we love? How big are your ambitions for those that are sitting around you right now? How big are your ambitions for those that will be sitting around your dining room table later on today? How big are our ambitions for ourselves in light of the kingdom? God's desire for us is glorious. It's bigger than we can imagine because God is a God with a perspective that encompasses everything from the ends of the universe to the details of our lives. Dear ones, in order that we 
and our families may share God's perspective. We need to be a mission-minded church. Let's pray.